Hey everybody, welcome to the next episode of the Thoughtful Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Matt. Hey everybody, I'm your co-host, Chris. And real quick, I just wanted to give a little timeline laid out for you guys. It seems we've established a decent bi-weekly release schedule for our episodes. And we're going to try to stick to that pretty, pretty evenly as we go along. And again, just to let you know ahead of time, there will probably be you know, 10 episodes, maybe up to 15 episodes of us, Matt and I, just laying down the foundation and getting all of these ideas out. And then that's when we want to start really having discussions with people. We can take callers. We can do interviews with people as well. But just to let you know, that's going to be more episodes deep after we've laid down this this groundwork so that we can constantly talk to people and have a reference to tie it back into all of these ideas and trains of thoughts all the way back to episode one. Yeah, and that would also include talking about different solutions as well, current events, technology, things like that. And as Chris said, tying it back to the greater the greater points of what we're trying to do with this podcast. Uh, Absolutely. Just a brief little quote as well. It's always good to arrive at conclusions and not to make them. So as we start to elaborate on this train of thought, as we have so far, it's always better to see what the ideas are and to come to that point, as opposed to just trying to determine them from the outset without any any idea of context or any conflicting information or anything. But I like that. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about human nature and the biopsychosocial organism that is the human being and some common human behavioral patterns. This is a very important topic, gives a bit of context for how we organize ourselves as a species in a society. And with a mm-hmm. lot of ape like species that come from that lineage, also being biopsychosocial creatures. I think it's a very important topic to have in the repertoire. Mm-hmm. So starting this discussion off, we're going to mention a, an evolutionary example that I'm going to bring forth real quick. So take yourself back, I think it was roughly a million years ago. Yeah, you remember that time. <laughs> <laughs> there, uh, a lot of ape and greater ape species came from some common ancestors. And the location that we're going to be talking about is in the Congo River Valley in Africa. And this is specifically the common ancestor between bonobos and chimps. So a lot of uh, socio, or not socio, um, archaeological biologists, I don't really know what the name of that field of study is, but uh, there have been studies that have seen where along the Congo River Valley, the parent species of bonobos and chimps diverged in their evolutionary paths, as I mentioned, roughly a million years ago or so. And for those who don't know, bonobos are an ape species that are very uh, matriarchal, egalitarian. They tend to grow up in very lush and abundant environments and are not a very aggressive species. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum, you have the chimpanzee, who, as we all know, is a very male-dominated society, very aggressive. They tend to grow up in really somewhat scarce environments of the savanna and some more desolate jungle regions where resources aren't as scarce. And the main point for me mentioning this is how two genetically identical ancestors and species can diverge so greatly in not only their societal behavior, but their evolutionary paths due to how their environment uh, brings us forth and how their society can reflect on what behavioral patterns these species have. So again, bonobos very much being a much less aggressive, much more egalitarian type of uh, ape society structure with chimps being essentially the polar opposite, aggressive, territorial, alpha, beta, scarce environment, and 
this very much shows a context for the evolutionary divergence that species can have depending on their access to resources and how their society as a whole functions and how that uh, how that breeds on their development and what traits come forth. So right. with that as a bit of context, we're going to move into discussing a very commonly mentioned fallacy, the nature versus nurture fallacy. So Chris, why don't you tackle that real quick? Right. Well, just like you had said, uh, we are biopsychic social creatures, psychosocial creatures, just like those chimps ancestors were, which means, you know, depending on where we go locationally and the behavioral patterns that starts to cause, well, we can diverge and have many different types of societies going on. And today in the world, you look around and we have more developed societies and we have lesser developed societies. And what you'll find is that take these more developed places, for instance, obviously the United States and the Western Europe countries, Japan, um, Canada, Asia, or, or certain part of Australia, and things like that, where we're a bit more modernized and, and developed in our social norms. You're going to have a lot more influence from the nurture side of things, because again, we have just a bit more of a stable uh, stability going on with the nature bit and here we'll have people affected people will be growing up in our society there'll be more social influences than than uh, uh say a third world society where nature is going to be a big influence so you know and here we don't really like as i keep saying here because i live in the united states and here Nature isn't necessarily going to affect my life as much. We have it under control, so to say. Um, but the nurture side of things can have a big effect on my life. And this could be from the, the people around me, family, school, and, and jobs, all of these different things that will influence how I actually align myself in this society. Now, you can contrast that to let's take a, a more of a, a tribal type of society places in Africa, certain tribes that are still going on in like Australia or any other, you know, Philippines, Islanders, things like that, where nature is going to greatly affect how people uh, enact with one another. You know, when a, like a, for an example, if a monsoon were to come through, and hit a tribe there's going to be a reaction and all of the people in that social area are going to be more cooperative to work together against it they're going to have to they're going to be forced by the nature to be more working together to to beat this this uh, uh the nature side that affects them so greatly whereas here and again here is in the united states we're going to most likely, you know, the nature side, we, we all are going to be somewhat of an individual about it. You know, hurricane comes through and I'm boarding up my windows, not my neighbors type of deal. So when this nature versus nurture discussion always comes along, what you need to know is that it's going to affect, have an effect around the entire globe. Okay. The different societies around the world are all going to have different levels of which one of these has actually shaped their socioeconomic system. And globally, when you start to take in how just around the world we can be so different because of nature, nurture combined with how you know developed that we are, it kind of ties in back to us all being a biopsychic social creature that is molded so to say, by just where we, where we began, where we grew up. And it's, it is a bit of a fallacy because there is so much more that goes into what creates us as a society than just the nature around us or the nurturing of our other people. There's, it's a bit more of a spectrum. You need to take in more factors than just 
oh, it's it's uh, the nature or the nurturing of, of humans or the human nature that causes the way that our society is. There's more details than that that actually have to be dived into. Exactly. And to be a bit uh, specific as well, it's actually what's called an either or fallacy, where the answers might lie in between more of a black and white uh, answer structure. So it, it very much belies in that fallacy. And to also give a bit of a definition as well, biopsychosocial organisms, it's, it's all within that term, but it's a combination of our biology, our psychology, and our social structures that determine how we behave as, as organisms. And mm -hmm. really, a lot of ape species and ancestors tend to be some of the only biopsychosocial creatures that we can quantify to a great degree, although there might be a few other species that exist on the planet, but these these highly social species tend to be the ones that, that are uh, quantified as such, just to give a bit of context. Mm -hmm. So to, to segue into the next point here, it's good to mention how Chris had just pointed out how social systems determine a lot of our behavior and different social systems will bring out different points in how we uh, organize and navigate ourselves within society. But as in the society as a whole, it's the economic system that determines how a society is, is oriented. If you're a hunter-gatherer society, a rudimentary agriculture society or a modern industrialized society that is the main orienting factor of how you go about your your daily life which is why it is so important to talk about socioeconomics as a whole it's very much the root foundation mechanism to have these discussions about it's it's the main way that we navigate our our daily existence and again, with, with the society being the way that we interact with each other on an individual level and in larger groups, but with the economic system being the main way that the society as a whole is functioning in order to meet everybody's daily needs to a certain degree, it gives a bit of context for why we are so keen on talking about our socioeconomic system and how that is the main way that we can affect change, and it is the root structural mechanism that we can go about to help enact better change. Right, exactly. And it was really good too as well that you mentioned, Chris, that, that the world as a whole exists on a spectrum and how it very much, again, isn't a black and white scenario. Different societies are going to have different inputs from both the nature and nurture side of things. So that is a very important point to mention as well. And yeah. One of the more important points that we're going to come into is talking about the more human nature side of things, how a lot of mm -hmm. people tend to have a preconceived notion where humans are inherently greedy or aggressive or warlike or blah, 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 blah. You know, we're all born sinners from the religious perspective or wh whatever that might be. Those are very much assumptions. If there's one thing we know, especially with the advent of modern neuroscience and the way that we've been able to study the human brain and how we exist as uh, creatures in that aspect, humans are many things at once. And it really is what the socioeconomic incentives are that bring certain traits to the forefront. Oh yeah, exactly. For an example, here in the states where we have this very competitive free market capitalism, the incentive of trying to always gain profit over your other competitor will obviously on the surface seem as greedy because you know you're you're trying to beat somebody, you're trying to get a better footing or a win, so to say, over somebody else. And some, you know, that's how someone might say, see, humans are greedy creatures because look at, look at what they're doing in a competitive market, just don't even care about their fellow human. They would 
totally, you know, destroy them to gain money, basically, or an edge, anything. But you have to think a little bit deeper than that. The reason that we want to gain something over our fellow human is because this system, the social economic system that we live in, promotes that type of behavior. You want to get some type of edge over somebody else. You want to protect your own type of uh, earnings, which could lead to not trusting others. And all of this is to try and survive and thrive in this specific system that we have here. But in a different type of system, which we will get into here shortly about maybe um, more like tribal systems or, 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 I'm sorry, tribal people, they, they're not incentivized by free market capitalism to gain a profit over their other, you know, tribes people, over their other community people. They're incentivized to work together or to, to find a, a common goal, at least, that they can, they can all need. They kind of need it in order to keep going for their society. And over there, you won't find greedy or, or a greed as a human trait or, or some type of, you know, uh, a nastiness as a human trait. Um, if you were to go observe those type of people, you would actually see that things like compassion or, or hmm, help me out here, Matt. I, I would say cooperation would be and cooperation would yeah. be the big, the big point there. Very much a dichotomy between competition versus cooperation. Uh, a good example is to look at something like the, the various cell phone companies as we mentioned in in previous episodes where instead of having like four or five big cell phone companies that all release phones with different little upgrades every now and again and they all have their proprietary technologies and they're all really hoarding various types of information if we worked in a more cooperative society these entities would come together and say hey how could we develop the best possible phone that would have the longest lifespan and working together as entities as opposed to, as Chris said, pushing somebody down in order to gain an advantage over the others, getting more market share, getting more profit, very much a cooperation versus competition mindset. And because our socioeconomic system is inherently competitive, that is the trait that is being pushed forth. Uh, another one to mention is fear versus trust. In a very competitive society, you're going to very much have low levels of, of trust relative as a public health metric between individuals and entities. And a fear mindset is what helps push forth that competitive uh, mentality so that you don't feel as uh jarred i guess when it comes to really pushing yourself to get that advantage uh in a in a competitive system and uh, a final one that we've talked about as well is greed versus selflessness as we mentioned a little bit ago if the society incentivizes you to be greedy hoarding resources doing what you can to push yourself above others versus Putting yourself in more of a selfless situation where you might do volunteer efforts or you might go out to you know open a door for an old lady or help somebody who's fallen up or or give food to somebody who who might be in need uh, as opposed to hoarding that all for yourself increasing your bank account exponentially stocking your pantry for the nuclear apocalypse that will never occur <laughs> you know uh, right. <laughs> things like that um there, there's definitely a few points that we felt like were, were pretty important to mention here. So again, with those being competition versus cooperation, fear versus trust, and greed versus selflessness. It's very much a dichotomy between what is clearly a better incentive, which are the latter parts of that, versus what we see today, which is, again, the, the more negative side of that. And that might be why people come forth and say, again, humans are inherently greedy and we're aggressive and acquisitive and we want to take everything over and, and get everything and, you know, 
uh, stock our coffers all the way to the tip top. Well, yeah, if the system incentivizes that, that's 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 the main point that we're trying to make here. Exactly. I'm, I just thought of as well when this worldwide pandemic happened a couple of years ago and the shelves, the stock on the shelves, I do believe it was toilet paper. The the fear of the pandemic led our society to absolutely fight over simple basic necessity of toilet paper where you had, you know, had Matt had just mentioned hoarding things. Because, you know, you, it, as opposed to a selflessness, like making sure everyone has enough, people were clearing shelves of paper towels and toilet paper for the most ridiculous reasons. They were scared in this system, thinking that they were going to be at a loss if they didn't act quickly to go and get these things. Whereas people, I know me as an individual personally, I was totally fine with buying one package of toilet paper when I needed it. And and to know that other community members will have access to this resource as well, just because there's this big fear mongering pandemic that hit everyone so quickly doesn't mean that everyone's going to be greedy and start taking all of this resources. There are individuals even in this system that know about, you know, helping one another and having more compassion or at least at a bare minimum you know, making sure there's enough supplies to go around to everybody. But like had, how Matt had just said, it comes down to what system you're currently living in and where around the world you are. And that could totally change the reaction you have, your, your instincts that you have to responding any type of worldly events or, or even like community events. Yeah, and to even take that a bit farther, I remember seeing a story of a guy who had bought like thousands of dollars worth of like hand sanitizer and sanitizer products and they, he was actually hawking them and selling them at, at much higher rates so yeah. he was actually taking the need of people and twisting that to make a profit off of what he hoarded as an individual, which is even taking that more to an extreme. So, again, if it's that greedy mindset that the society incentivizes, then that is going to be one of the main traits that an individual might exhibit in order to try and gain a bigger foothold within the economic sphere. Exactly. It does not mean that that is our human nature. That human nature is actually, again, just greatly influenced by the fact that we are moldable, biopsychic, social, psychosocial creatures who actually tend to act based off of our, again, our environment, our psychology, and our social system that we're living in at that time. Yeah, and if there are a few things that we do know for certain, it's that humans adapt to survive, we have high levels of neuroplasticity, and that humans are many things at once. As we had mm -hmm. said earlier, we are what the incentives of the society are that bring out certain traits, and with the linking of all three of those things, that is really the foundation of what the human being is. So it's yes. it's very important to mention that. And that actually segues quite nicely into the last point of this discussion, which is bringing more of a human example. I had started off this episode by talking about the bonobos and chimps comparison, which, yes, they are uh, genetic ancestors and are pretty close to what we are as, as human beings in terms of our evolutionary scale. But a more pertinent example might be talking about also, as Chris had mentioned earlier, a lot of indigenous populations, whether in Africa, South America, different island tribes, things like that. And having that as a final example in this discussion. So a lot of these societies have a different mode of organization. I even pointed this out in the first episode where uh, socio-archaeologists and the early sociologists went out into the field and actually studied a lot of these tribes in the 50s, 60s, things like that, where these tribes very much were still separate from modern society. They've definitely been intruded upon 
as time has gone on. But as we've observed these societies, they are very selfless. There is no hoarding of resources. If anything, it would be for the, the tribe as a whole. Mm -hmm. There is a very cooperative nature, and if in if a hierarchy exists, if any at all, it is due to the experience of certain individuals. You can consider the situation of of sort of a tribal elder type figure, where they've lived the longest, they've been around the longest, so they will be the ones who the younger entities of the tribe or the the community will default to. When it comes to learning knowledge, disseminating knowledge, and and figuring out how to really work about society itself, so they really exemplify a lot of the more positive traits that we had mentioned before: the co the competition versus cooperation, fear versus trust, greed versus selflessness. A lot of these societies exemplify that. They're not worrying about fishing all the fish and having it just for their little family group where they, they would spread that across the tribe as a whole. They very much trust each other. There are very high levels of, of uh, social capital, as we had mentioned in the second episode, and everybody knows that everybody has uh, each other's backs. And with the most important point being the cooperative nature, everybody is looking out for their fellow man, so they are willing to very much go towards the aid of somebody who might be hurt or injured or can't pull their weight and they're willing to supplement that and really again cooperate to help bring out the best situation for not only the benefactors of the tribe but for the tribe as a whole uh, whether you're young old decrepit in between pregnant whatever it might be everybody's willing to cooperate to help bring about the best situation for the society as a whole yep yep in order to survive yeah and it's it's very much a, a again a good contrast to have compared to more modern society that is oriented by free market capitalism as the socioeconomic structure that we all uh, adhere to do you have any uh, anything you want to add chris i was actually just gonna ask you if you had a takeaway i did think of something while you were talking about the indigenous people just now because i was trying to think of why you know we have these differences and we know that we are very moldable creatures based off of you know where our socioeconomics are as where to where we live and everything but the reason i threw out that word in order to survive is i think of course the that's the goal of all humans right is in order to survive and thrive yep um you know, being the virus that we are, viruses don't want to die. We want to keep living. And what I, what I'm, what I'm contemplating in my head here is the difference between living in a modern social economic society, especially ours here in the United States. Um, for us to survive in this system, we have to use this system. We have to gain profits. We have to, and sometimes that means over others. You know, we have to compete, we have to um, uh, hoard or, or, you know, stock our shelves in order to survive here. Whereas these indigenous places, their surviving in their community means, you know, the, the actual, actually surviving, you know, working together to gain food for the entire tribe, a, a, a community hunt or a community um, um, stash of of their vegetation or you know ga gathering water way more likely these people are going to work together and cooperate in order to survive whereas here all we need to do to survive is essentially make money and you know all of the the traits that come along with trying to make money in free market capitalism just kind of tossing that back and forth in my head i think that's a good point and I think another element as well is because they need to be so connected with nature and the world around them, they very much have a different mode of how their society goes about its its organization. And in our more modern context, since society is so disconnected from the natural world to a lot of degrees with the, the negative externalities that we've mentioned before, the environmental destabilization of episode two, 
a lot of these topics show us that because we're so disconnected, there is really a lot of self-referencing incentives and modes that we need to to go towards as opposed to connecting ourselves more back with nature and how mm-hmm. our our ancestors and those before us had to survive they they were very much more affected by the world around them and they had to come together and have these more positive traits come to the forefront in order to just to just live and as as you had said chris yeah organisms that's that's the main drive is to 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 live reproduce survive and because we have become so disconnected from that that natural side of the equation i think that has pushed us towards having those more negative attributes come out in the way that society is is functioning in our in our day and age right right like to tie it into the big picture of just having a viable system. I think it was you uh, and back in episode one who had mentioned that the greatest example of a viable system is nature itself. Yes. And like how you'd said, we've become so disconnected with nature that I, I think is uh, an aspect that allowed our system to become so unviable because we no longer take into account these these like you know um externalities like our waste or natural um uh, natural disasters whereas these indigenous tribes who are very much more connected to nature and relying on nature uh, much more than we are their system that they live in is going to be uh just just by by default I guess more viable you know they they know that they can't overhunt or overfish or or ruin their lands yeah. or fight over their lands. They're relying on these these types of things. Yeah, again, today society very much views itself as a separate entity to the natural world around us. And because mm-hmm. that isn't a main orienting factor with how uh, our socioeconomic system functions that very much again brings out those negative traits and having that be uh, again the main point that we're trying to bring across here that changing the socioeconomic system to one that more emulates nature since as chris said as we as we've mentioned before with nature being the ultimate viable system it's something we need to become more in tune with in order to help really alleviate a lot of these issues yep I see the uh, the differences, you know, and how we can come so far in our society, so far away from the environment and from nature. And it's been unchecked for so long that now we have things like the ice caps completely melting, our oceans fooling full of plastic and waste, and our air becoming of a lower quality. You know, we just, uh, to be quite blank, don't give an F about these things in our society right now. Yeah, that's that's very much true, and that's that's what we're looking to help bring to the surface here with these these discussions. But uh, that'll be it for today's episode, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. That'll do it. Yep, that'll do it. So we will catch you all in the next two weeks for for the new episode. Have a good one, everybody.